All right, today I want to just um, preach on the topic of giving God your best. So I've, I've decided to preach this sermon tonight. I just want to sort of challenge you guys, um, get you guys reflecting on your own Christian walk, uh, what you are doing for God, and just want to uh, sort of remind you and exhort you and encourage you, provoke you, whatever word you want to use, whichever word you like, use that word, you know. You don't like being provoked, then be encouraged, whatever. So um, get you thinking about, you know, putting God first, doing the best for God in your life. You know, we know that in you know, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether, ye, whether therefore you eat or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. You know, the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Um, so there's no doubt that even in the most mundane thing as eating and drinking, we ought to do that to the glory of God. How much more so when we think about the work that we do and the way we live our life, the, the testimony that we show to the world, should those even more so be done to the glory of God and done to the best with God at the forefront of our mind, um, giving God our best. Now, when it comes to giving, obviously, you know, there's the obvious thought of money and there's time, right? There really isn't anything else. If you're thinking about giving something to somebody, right? Giving somebody your best, your worst, whatever, giving something, you can only either give your time or your money. And, you know, money represents your possessions, right? And, and really, they're one and the same thing. You know, they say time is money because you know, your possessions is, is like a value of the time that you have left. You know, it takes time to make money and money can get you more time. So they're really one and the same thing. This is your life. Your life is measured in time and possessions, whether it's money or whatnot. So when it comes to giving, when you give to God, are you giving your best? This is the question I want you to reflect on tonight. Anything you do for God, you know, whether it's church or in your work or in your family, or in your soul winning, in your Bible reading, in your prayer, in your Christian life, are you giving your best? Just think about that question. Are you giving your best? Just, just think about that and reflect on that. And if when you think about that, you think, oh boy, I don't give my best. You know, that's what this, that's what this sermon's for. That's what this sermon is about. This sermon is to, to just bring it to the forefront of your mind. Am I doing my best? And if I'm not, I should start doing my best. I should start giving my best to God. So hopefully a couple of quick thoughts for you as we um, I just go through this. Obviously, when you're giving something, whether it's time or it's material possessions, um, there's two factors, right? There's the quantity and then there's the quality, right? So I want to just talk first about the quantity. The quantity. Are we giving our best quantity to God? And I just say best because best is going to be different for each person, right? So when we say you have to give to God, whether it's time or possessions, you can't really set just a standard for everybody, right? Because everybody's different, right? Everybody has a different amount of time based on, you know, responsibilities that they have in their life. And everybody has a different amount of possessions or wealth that they can give to other things other than the responsibilities they have in their own personal life. Let's look at this story in Mark 12. This is a very familiar story where Jesus is sitting in the temple. It says here, Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples, and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. Now, I'm, you know, th th this is saying that that two mites that that person had, that was ev all the money that she had. I don't, because obviously all her living doesn't necessarily refer to all her possessions because she would have had clothes, right? I'm sure, I don't know if she was living somewhere, you know, maybe she didn't. Maybe she wasn't living anywhere and that's all she had. But she wanted to give to God. And she cast in two mites in another passage that says a farthing. I'm not exactly sure how much that is worth. But obviously this is a lot less than those rich people were casting in. So if you missed what was happening there, Jesus is sitting in, in the temple. He's seeing people cast money into the treasury, which is, I don't know what it would look like, you know, a box where people put their funds in. Kind of like we have our box at the front. 
um, but you know, probably not so uh, uh, subtle, is it? Because it's, it's a point where you can sit in the temple and see people throwing money in. And he sees all these rich people casting a lot in, and then he sees this poor widow casting two mites, and he says to his disciples, she actually put in more than the rich people did. Because even though the rich people are giving a lot, right, the proportion is much smaller because the widow cast in two mites, but that was everything that she had. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what God is commanding, right? Like, because God, everything belongs to God. The lesson here is not that you just give, you know, sell everything and just give it to a church organization. That's not what I'm saying. But the question is, does everything you own, do you think of it as I'm using it for God? You know, it's, it's not necessarily mine, but everything I have and everything I own, this is being commended here. The other thing is, we see the lesson from this story is that when God looks down at your giving, he doesn't necessarily look at the amount. That's what man looks at, right? Man sees somebody like Bill Gates and thinks, well, man, this guy is just giving millions and millions of do dollars to charity. But like this says here, he's giving of his abundance because he has so many more billions of dollars, right? What is the percentage that he is giving? So here we learn that it's not just the amount you give, it's the proportion that you give. God knows because other people don't know how much wealth you have. They just see how much the amount that's given. But they don't know that that may only be like 0.01% of your wealth. Whereas somebody that gives much less then you might, or much less than somebody else, is actually giving a much higher proportion of their time and their material possession. So Jesus doesn't count the amount, but he counts the proportion because everybody is different, right? He can't, he's not measuring everyone by the same scale. It's like we learn in the parable of the talents where everyone's, one, one servant's given one, one servant's given two, one servant's given five, and when they all double it, they're all rewarded the same. Well, when there's one with two and the one with five, double it. They are rewarded the same. So Jesus looks at the proportion based on what you have and what you have given. And only God knows, and you know, you know, unless you tell somebody else, um, what that is. But are you giving your best? Are you giving the best quantity? Now, obviously, some applications are to give to a ministry that is doing the work of God. You know, I always appreciate that you guys give to this ministry and it helps us to pay the bills. It helps me to live closer. Uh, you know, one day I do, I uh, would like to be full time, you know, and I think it would be a, a much more benefit to this church. But obviously that can only happen if people give to this work. But this church doesn't need to be the only recipient of your offerings. You know, I don't, I'll teach on tithes and offerings another time. But you know, just because you give, you know, I, I definitely encourage, you know, if you uh, um, value this church and you want this church to grow and keep going and, you know, help me have more time to do what I do for this church, hey, you know, I definitely encourage you to, to give. Um, but this church doesn't need to be the only recipient of your offerings. You don't need to think, you know, am I only allowed to give to the church or through the church that I'm a part of. No, you can give directly to whatever you want. If there's, if there's somebody doing the work of God or there's a ministry that you believe is valuable, you know, give to them. You know, support that ministry with your finances because, you know, this is how God's economy works. You know, if you want, if you appreciate that ministry and you want it to grow, you want it to flourish, you know, that it won't, it can't exist. You know, it can't grow if it doesn't have a way to fund it. Um, just because that the person running it uh, needs, needs a living if he's going to invest all that time into doing what he's doing or she's doing what she's doing. So I just wanted to make that point there. I'm not, I'm not making this point to say you necessarily have to give to this church. It's a free choice that you have if you value um, uh, this church. But if there's another ministry that you value, give to that. As long as you're giving to God, are you giving your best? That's the question. Now, it might not be that you're giving it necessarily to an organization. Um, you may be giving to a specific person. If there's somebody that you know is in need or you, you want to help somebody pay their bills or you want to help somebody with something, um, you can help directly. You know, you don't have to help through an organization. Like, you don't have to give to this charity that's giving to people to help feed them if you know somebody that needs help being fed. You know, just give to them directly. 
So there are many ways you can give. And the question is, are you giving your best? Are you giving and are you doing it for the glory of God? Uh, one thing that I do do at this church is if you want to give something to somebody anonymously, I do think this is where the church can help, where if you want to give something to somebody anonymously, you can either put it in the box or you can direct deposit it into the account. And if it's for somebody, if you say for this person, I will honour that and I will, I will pass those funds on. And then it can be anonymous if you choose to stay anonymous. So that's one thing we do. If you want to give through the church anonymously to somebody that you know uh, would appreciate those funds and it might help them. Uh, and we definitely use those funds as well to help people. You know, there are people that have needed bills paid. And, you know, if you ever find yourself in a financial bind, you know, don't be scared to, to come to me and, you know, we can try and figure things out. We can figure out, you know, you know why you're in that bind and, and talk about that. But also, if there, if there are just bills that you can't get paid and, you know, your car's going to get repoed or you're going to get kicked out of your house or something, then definitely come to me and we'll, that's what those funds are there for. They're, we have funds in the bank account so it can be used to help people. And there is a time to give and there's a time to receive, right? So don't feel bad if sometimes you need to receive funds from the church because you will give funds when you have it. This is the principle in the Bible. There's times where you have abundance and you give and there are times when you need it and you, you need to take. So that's, um, you know, one application, right? Is just is giving quantity, giving a quantity of possessions, whether it's money or material wealth. And the other is your time. Let's go to Joshua. Joshua eleven fifteen. I'm just going to read this passage here. As the Lord commanded Moses, his servant. So if you remember the story where Moses, because he struck the rock, if you remember the first time, I don't know if you remember the story, but he, he was asked to speak to this rock, right? And then water would come out to... To, to, um, for the nation of Israel to, to drink. And the second time, right, God told him, speak to the rock. Uh, oh, sorry. The first time he, he struck the rock, I think. I'm trying to remember the story now. The first I think he struck the rock. He said, strike the rock, and then the water would come out. So he struck the rock, and then water came out, and then everyone could drink. But the second time, God told Moses to just speak to the rock, and then the rock would bring forth water. But then Moses got upset with everybody, right? And then he said, here now, you rebels, must I, must I fetch you water out of this rock? So, and then he struck the rock the second time. And water did come out, right? So water came out and everybody could drink. But then God said, because you didn't obey me, you struck the rock instead of speaking to the rock. Because of that, you're not allowed to go into the promised land. So Moses, because he added to God's commandment, Moses was prevented from going into the promised land. And that's why... Um, Exodus, you know, sort of ends with Moses being in the mountain, seeing the promised land, but not being able to go in. And then he dies in the mountain and God buries his body or takes his body. We don't know what happens to Moses' body. So then Joshua takes over, right? And Joshua is the one that actually leads the nation of Israel into battle to take over the promised land and, and get that inheritance. So Moses has commanded Joshua what he needs to do in the promised land and then we get to joshua 11 after there's all these wars and it says here in verse 15 as the lord commanded moses his servant so did moses command joshua and so did joshua he left nothing undone of all that the lord commanded moses and you know i didn't get this point you know this is this is a, a famous sermon from jack hile so i'm not going to take credit but one of the awesome points he brings up in that sermon is that this point here where he says, Joshua left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. And the point he sort of brings up here is, you know, all of us, we only have a limited amount of time, right? We only have a limited amount of time. We do not have unlimited time. So if we wanted to accomplish everything we wanted to accomplish, it's just physically not possible. So something is going to be left undone. Right? Because there are some things you are not going to be able to accomplish, you are not going to be able to complete, you're not going to be able to spend time on. The question is, what are you going to left, uh, leave undone? In Joshua's case, Joshua did what the Lord commanded. He made sure that if God wanted him to do something, he didn't leave that undone. He left the things that God did not command him undone. And that's how we need to think about our spiritual life, is what are we leaving undone in our life. You know, the Christian life is very simple, right? There's not really much to it. Um, it's just not easy, right? 
if you think about the things in the Christian life, um, church, you know, Bible, soul winning, you know, evangelism, prayer, you know, your daily walk, you know, you're just building up your character and walking in the spirit. These are the things that God has commanded us to do. You know, these are the things that are required of a Christian. Are you leaving them undone? You know, when you think about how you spend your time, because you've got non-essentials, right? You've got your career aspirations, uh, you know, business aspirations, uh, I mean, sporting, uh, sporting and hobbies, or travel and experiences, celebrations. These are all things that are non-essential. These are things that are, you know, they're part of life, right? But they're not commanded by God. God doesn't command you to have celebration, doesn't command you to go on a holiday, doesn't command you to necessarily, you know, um, you know, be part of a, a great sporting organization or a business organization. Like these are things that people aspire to. And there's not, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with them, right? But I'm saying are those being done and are things in your Christian life where God has commanded you to do staying undone? Because remember, Joshua says he left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. So what was commanded to Moses and then commanded to Joshua, he made sure those were not undone. So these are the, the non-essentials in our life. Are we getting them done, but not getting the Christian life things done? Whereas it really should be the other way around, right? If we think about priorities, we should be making sure we are doing those Christian things. And then with the time that we have apart from those, we are getting those other things done, those other non-essential things. And, I don't, I, and I'm just giving like, you know, topics of these things, you know, and I want to say certain specifics because, you know, it's, it's always different for different people. Um, because I do believe there is a place for, uh, you know, R&R, &R, you know, relax, what does it say? Refresh, what do they call it? Refresh? Yeah. Refresh and relaxation? Refresh and recovery? You know, you guys know what I'm talking about. R and R, whatever those R stand for. Um, so think about that. So remember, reflect on this question: Am I giving God my best? Am I giving God my best quality, quanti uh, quantity of time and uh, possessions? You know, do you really want to face God and consider why you left His commandments undone? You know, you want to face God, and you know, you shed the flesh. You realize what's valuable in life, and you're going to stand there and think oh man, why did I waste my life doing all these non-essential things and I left what God commanded me undone? Undone. What, do you, what are you going to leave undone? So that's quantity. Let's think about quality now. Let's go to Numbers. Numbers 18. Um, I just want to read you this passage from Numbers 18. And i uh, just show you a couple of things here. And the Lord spake unto Aaron, behold. So this, this, this passage is about um, the tithe and about how the tithe was um, to, to uh, take care of the Leviticals, uh, the, the Levites. And then the Levites would then tithe a tenth of their tithe in order to give to the, the priests, uh, which was Aaron's line. And the Lord spake unto Aaron, behold, I, have, I also have given thee the charge of mine heave offerings, of all the hallowed things of the children of Israel, unto thee have I given them by reason of the anointing and to thy sons by an ordinance forever. This shall be thine of the most holy things reserved from the fire. Every oblation of theirs, every meat offering of theirs and every sin offering of theirs and every trespass offering of theirs, which they shall render unto me, shall be most holy for thee and for thy sons. So it's interesting. I, I mean, I, I'm still studying this out. And when I sort of figure it all out, I want to preach it for you guys but it seems as though um all the offer because remember there was the tithe which was the tenth of the land's increase and the herds and the flocks increase which was given to the levites but all, you remember when you read through leviticus there's all these offerings sin offerings free will offerings heave offerings and there's all these different things these were actually given to the to the to the priests so Aaron and Moses were Levites I don't know if you know if you remember the beginning of Exodus that a Levite married a woman and bear a son and his name that was Moses she, she put in the ark of bulrushes and went down the river so Moses and Aaron if you didn't know were actually Levites you know they were brothers uh, Aaron was I think three years older than Moses um, 
And then Aaron was appointed as basically uh, the, the, the priest, uh, the, the father of the priests um, in the Levitical priesthood. And then the Levite tribe was given to Aaron in order to help with the running of the tabernacle. So the priests would actually do the offerings, but the Levites, there were three families, uh, uh, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari, I think. And each one of those families had a different job in the temple. Like one was to, I think, pull it down and set it up, and another was to like set up the table and everything. And I can't remember what the last one was. So they all had different jobs. Right? So this is saying here so far that all those offerings that Israel offers goes to uh, Aaron, the priest, Aaron and, his, and the priests. Uh, in the most holy place thou sh uh, shalt thou eat it, every male shall eat it, it shall be holy unto thee, and this is thine, the heave offering of their gift with all the wave offerings of the children of Israel. I have given them unto thee and to thy sons and to thy daughters with thee by a statute forever. Everyone that is clean in thy house shall eat of it. All, and now, now notice this, all the best of the oil and all the best of the wine and of the wheat, the first fruits of them which shall, they shall offer unto the Lord, them have I given thee. So God is saying here to, to Aaron and the priests, right, saying all the offerings is yours. And it's sort of assumed in here that the offerings that people are giving to the Lord are their best, right? They're giving the best. They're offering the best. That's why it's the first, it's the best, and that is what is given to the priests. And whatsoever is first ripe in the land, which they shall bring unto the Lord, shall be thine. Everyone that is clean in thine house shall eat of it. Everything devoted in Israel shall be thine. Everything that openeth the matrix in all flesh, which they bring unto the Lord, whether it be of men or beasts, shall be thine. Nevertheless, the firstborn of man shalt thou surely redeem, and the firstling of unclean beasts shalt thou redeem. And those that are to be redeemed from a month old shalt thou redeem according to thine estimation for the money of five shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary, which is 20 giras. And I'll just go further down where I wanted to show you. We'll get on to now the, um, the Levites. 20, verse 21. And behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tenth in Israel for an inheritance for their service which they serve, even the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. Neither must the children of Israel henceforth come nigh the tabernacle of the congregation, lest they bear sin and die. But the Levites shall do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they shall bear their iniquity. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations that among the children of Israel they have no inheritance. But the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer as an heave offering unto the Lord, I have given to the Levites to inherit. Therefore I have said unto them, Among the children of Israel they shall have no inheritance. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Thus speak unto the Levites, and say unto them, When ye take of the tithes of the children of Israel, the tithes which I, give you, which, which I have given you from them for your inheritance, then ye shall offer up an heave offering of it for the Lord, even a tenth part of the tithe. And this is your heave offering, and this your heave offering shall be reckoned unto you as though it were the corn of the threshing floor and as the fullness of the winepress. So if you notice here, everybody else has land to farm and to herd flock. They are giving a tenth to the Levites because the Levites, because they are to work the tabernacle, they don't have land in order to farm or to herd cattle and sheep or lambs or whatever. So they, their inheritance was the tithe. It was a tenth of whatever that increase was. And then they would then offer a tenth of that. And then that would be the, the priests. That would be Aaron and the priests to, um, uh, that would be theirs. Thus ye, shall also, thus ye also shall offer an heave offering unto the Lord of all your tithes, which ye receive of the children of Israel, and ye shall give thereof the Lord's heave offering to Aaron the priest. And of all your gifts ye shall offer every heave offering of the Lord, of all the best of all the best thereof, even the hallowed part thereof out of it. Therefore thou shalt say unto them, when ye have heaved the best thereof from it, then it shall be counted unto the Levites as the increase of the threshing floor and as the increase of the winepress. So it's saying there, the tithe that you get, that's as though you had land, right? Because that was, you know, you didn't get land, the Levites. They get the, the tithe, that's as though they had the land and they did the threshing floor and the winepress. And then they would then give a tenth of that to Aaron the priest. 
And you shall eat it in every place ye and your households, for it is your reward for your service in the tabernacle of the congregation. And ye shall bear no sin by reason of it when ye have heaved from it the best of it. Neither shall ye pollute the holy things of the children of Israel, lest ye die. So what's the lesson that we see here? You know, I, I'm not uh, going to this passage, you know, you guys may not know my position on tithes. I don't necessarily, I don't believe that tithes are for the New Testament. Um, New Testament is just, is just voluntary giving. Um, the tithe is something in the Old Testament where, you know, because the Levitical priesthood did not have an inheritance, the tithe was then to support them, um, kind of like we give taxes to the government. That was like the tax on Israel, the 10% of the land to go to the Levitical priesthood because they were governed by that Levitical priesthood. If you remember, the Levites and the priests would judge for Israel. A lot of them would. But the question is here, what we can learn from this passage is that this offering that was given to God ought to be our best, right? So it's not just about the quantity. If you're giving a, qu a large quantity to God, but it's not your best, that's not what God wants. God wants your best. And we see here that when they gave the tithe to the Levites, that was the best. And then when they gave the tenth of that tithe to Aaron and their offerings, the assumption in here is that they are getting the best of all the land because God expects the best when things are offered to him. So how can we apply this in, in the New Testament? How can we apply this to us? Well, I've, I've thought of a few examples, and this is not an, an exhaustive list by any means. But I just think one example I thought of was, you know, when we bring food for church, when we bring food for church or we, we do something at church, you know, whether we, uh, you know, because obviously money is, is not good or bad, right? It's just, you know, that, that's money and then that can be used for something. But if we're going to create something or we're going to bring something for church, are we doing our best? You know, I think about, you know, for example, bringing leftovers from meals for church. You know, generally, it's, it's why is it always church that gets the leftovers? You know, it's like you have a big celebration and then, oh, you know, there's all these leftovers left over and then, oh, well, we'll bring it to church. They'll, they'll eat it, right? And I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that it's necessarily wrong. You know, I'm not saying that it's wrong to bring leftovers. You know, I appreciate, you know, when people bring food along. What I'm getting at is not what necessarily you bring, it's the heart in which it's brought, right? If, if God always gets the leftovers, because this is God's house, right? This is God's body, this is the body of Christ. Why should God always get the leftovers, right? Why does God always get the second best? You know, why does God always get the things you don't want anymore? You don't want something, so I donate it to church. You know, we're not going to eat the rest of this, so I donate it to church. It should be the other way around, shouldn't it? Shouldn't it be that, you know, I made something for God, and then... I bring those leftovers home for my family or whatever because shouldn't, shouldn't they come second? So i just getting us to reflect on this. Is Are we doing our best for God when we do something for God? Or is God just getting your crumbs? Is God just getting your leftovers? You know, God's just getting what's convenient for you. That's not your best if it's just something you do just because it's easy, right? You give something to God, you give your best. Um, you know, you're doing something that is the best of your ability. Um, I think, you know, like I already said this, you know, old equipment um, f for meetings. Um, you know, uh, just p people donating, like, you know, old tech and things like that. You know, there's nothing necessarily wrong. I'm not saying it's necessarily wrong. I'm saying is, is the heart there where when I give something for God, I'm giving the best. It can be, and it's not just giving things. It's also in giving your service, Right? Like when you do things for God, do you do your best? You know, when you help out at church, are you doing your best? When you clean up, you know, when you set things up, are you doing your best for God? Um, you know, you, know you, you might, you're at home, you keep things, everything nice and clean and everything's nice and ordered and you, and you, and you make sure everything is, is right. But when you come to the house of God and you help out in this building, do you have that same attitude where, where you're doing your best for God? Um, you know, even if you're not doing something for church, when you're doing something for a fellow believer, you know, let's say you help somebody move, right? Or you help somebody, uh, you know, do something like cut their lawn or help them clean up. Do you do your best? You know, because you're serving God when you're serving another believer. Um, so it's not just material things, it's in services too. We think about our effort and our commitment 
You know, you think about at your job, you know, your job, you're there on time, you work hard. But then when it comes to the things of God, you know, you're late to soul winning, you're not prepared, you know, you're late to church, you don't come with the right frame of mind, you don't come ready to serve. It's just that same heart issue of are you giving your best to God? So that's the material side of it. But what about your time? Your time, are you giving your best time to God? We talked about the quantity, right? Well, we don't have unlimited quantity of time. So the question is, what do I leave undone? You know, am I making sure that God is part of my schedule? But what do you think about when you think I'm giving God time in terms of the quality of my time? Ecclesiastes 12, whenever I think of the quality of our time, I'm thinking, are you serving God when you have the most strength, when you have the most energy, when you're the most awake? <laughs> you know, I think, of, um, I think of like, you know, when people read the Bible, right? Do you read the Bible when you are alert and actually going to, you know, in a position where you're ready for God to teach you something, show you something from the Bible? But, you know, and all of us has done this, you know, we snuggle into bed, you know, we sort of like get comfortable and we say we're going to read our Bible. And then you might read like a couple of verses and then you fall asleep. Do you know what I mean? Whereas, you know, when you, when you want to learn something for your work, hey, you do it when you're like primed, ready to listen, right? You're ready to take this information. You're ready to improve yourself. But, you know, when you come to church, are you the same? When you read your Bible, are you the same? Are you giving God your best? Not just the quantity, but the quality of time. Look at what Ecclesiastes 12 teaches us here. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. While the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. In the day, and we see here now this, this beautiful uh, sort of poetic uh, reading of the description of our body. In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble. So what are the keepers? The hands, you know, taking care of the house, this body. And the strong men shall bow themselves. So a lot of people believe that that is your legs, you know, when your legs are no longer able to keep yourself up. Uh, and the grinders cease, you know, the teeth, because they are few. And those that look out of the windows be darkened. You, know, you start to lose your vision. You start to, you know, can't see things as well as you used to. You know, and it's, it's harder now to read the Bible, maybe because your vision's not as good. It's hard to stay, you know, awake so long you know it's harder to to go soul winning as much as you would like to because the strong men are not as strong anymore right and the doors shall be shut in the streets when the sound of the grinding is low so what is that that's saying like the doors shall be shut in the streets like because when you're older you go to bed earlier don't you and you can't hear as well and you wake up a lot earlier he shall rise up at the voice of the bird and all the daughters of music shall be brought low. It's just, you're, you're not really, I think it's talking about, you know, not really wanting to get out there and, and, and be as uh, sociable anymore when you're older. Also, when they shall be afraid of that which is high. So you have a lot more fear, a lot, you have a lot more reservation, you know, when you're older. And fears shall be in the way, and the almond tree shall flourish. So that's, I believe, talking about the white hairs, you know, as you, as you get older. Uh, and the grasshopper shall be a burden. Now, I haven't figured out what that grasshopper is. So is, if anyone knows what the grasshopper is, that's a burden. Is it, I don't know, is it, I don't know what it is. What's a burden when you're older? Is it just like having to go to the toilet or something is a burden? Um, and desire shall fail. So sexual desire, you know, you don't have that, uh, that drive anymore. Because man goeth to his long home and the mourners go about the streets. Or ever the silver cord be loosed. So this is your, talking about your spinal cord. Or the golden bowl be broken. Um, that could be that you're going a bit insane. You know, you, your, your brain's not working as it should. Or the pitcher be broken at the fountain. I don't know if that's talking about the bloodstream. You know, you start having blood problems when you're older. You know, it's, uh, you, you know, blood clotting and things like that when people get older. Or the wheel broken at the cistern. So the reason why I think that water is referring to the blood, because if you think of a cistern, it's power, it's generating, right? And it just keeps going. So our heart is kind of beating that, that, that blood around our body. And it's like your heart starts to fail. And the water, uh, the blood is not flowing as it should. And then it talks about death. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, 
and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, all is vanity. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and sent in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. The words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. And further by these, my son, be admonished of making many books, there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret, secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So are we giving God our best time? Right, so we talked about quantity, the quality of the things we give God, whether it's material possessions or whether it's our effort, our commitment. But are we giving God our best time? This is why the Bible says, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Not remember him tomorrow in the days of thy youth, right? It's remember him now in the days of thy youth while you're young because when you're old yes you might have more time but you're going to have more health problems too right it's going to be harder to do as much as you do when you're young and that's why god is saying remember now while you have the youth while you have the strength while you have the the mind and the strength and the capability and you know the strong legs you know the ability to, to, the mobility to get where you want to be you know engage in conversations be an encouragement provoke people unto love and good works you ought to be doing that when you have the strength and giving your best to god not hey i'm going to give my best to my job and my work and everything else that i could give my best to while god is going to get what i've got left after I poured my heart and soul into something that's not essential. Do you see what I mean? Are you giving your best to God? Are you using the time of your youth when you have the strength and the energy to make sure that some of that is invested into the work of God rather than saying, well, I'm going to put God on the back burner now and then later on um, I'm going to serve God. No, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. How are you using your life to serve God? You know, we've got these things. You know, and if, if you say, you know, people that are, you know, you're younger, maybe you're not married, maybe you don't work a full-time job yet. If you say to me now, or you say to yourself now, I just don't have time to serve God now. Man, good luck trying to serve God once you're married and have children and have other responsibilities, to, you know, Life does not get less busy. Life is always busy. Everyone's got things to fill their life with. It doesn't matter what stage of life you are, you know, whether you're a teenager, whether you're a young adult, whether you're married, whether you have children, whether you're older, there is always things to fill your life with. So there's no such thing as too busy to, to serve God. It's just how, where is God in your priorities? right? It, the only reason why you're too busy to serve God is because God has not gone up in your priorities to the point where he's worthy of some of your time, right? Because think about the things that you will move your schedule for. There are things in your life that you make sure get done. Why? Because it's a priority. Do you see? So don't wait for the day where you have time for God. If you don't have time for God now, you will never have time for God. Why? Because it's not about how much time you have. It's about where you're prioritizing God. And if, you're, if you don't prioritize God later on in your life, you'll never have time. So do you see what I mean? It's, a, it's about where your heart sits. Is, if you have a heart that wants to prioritize God, you'll give God time. But if you don't have a heart to serve God now, and that doesn't change, you'll, ju you'll just never serve God. Do you see? Because God will never be a high priority enough because life just always has, we always have things to do, right? That's why you have to make sure that God is a part of your life at every stage. You know, don't wait until later to get involved in the soul winning. Don't wait until later to, to, to grow in your Christian life and try and get people saved and, and, and go and get them to heaven because what if you die? You know, what if you get in a car accident? I mean, you know, we just had one example where one of our church members almost died. You know, do, do you think they saw that coming? But thank God, you know, they're investing time serving God. But are you giving your best or are you putting it off and then one day you may never do anything because you've never prioritized God in your life? 
Every day, right, we're moving closer to the day of our death. James says, you know, what is your life? You know, what is it? It's but a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Right? How short is life? You know, it was, it was 2015 when we started this church. 2016, I felt like, you know, the new year only just happened. Now we're like halfway through 2017. How fast is life going? How fast is time going? And you're going to get to your life later on and it's just all going to be gone. And the question is, what did I give to God? Did I give my best? Did I give him anything? You know, did I do anything for him? So just think about that. That's, this is the point of this sermon today, is just to think, did I give my, am I giving my best to God? Am I giving the most to God? Am I giving the best quality to God? Or is God just getting my leftovers? You know, is, 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 that, is that what God deserves? Does God only deserve your leftovers after everything he's done for you that we can't give him our best? You know, that's something that we ought to think about. I hope that sort of provokes you to, to, to do more with your life and then when you do things for God that you do your best. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord, uh, for your word. Um, thank you, Lord, that your word reminds us uh, how much you do for us and uh, what you have done for us, Lord. Um, Lord, we are, you know, so, we are so self-centered in our life. Um, Lord, I pray that you would help us to um, have our eyes on eternal things, have our eyes on spiritual things. Lord, help us to love as we ought to love you. Um, Lord, thank you for loving us. Even if we come short, Lord, you still love us with, um, with a great love. So help us, Lord, to, to be appreciative of that. And uh, Lord, when we give, that we give you our best. Uh, we thank you, Lord, and we um, thank you for Jesus. Um, you gave your best when you came for us and you died on the cross. Uh, Lord, help us to follow in your footsteps. Um, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.